welcome back to Reaper Pro Tips with me, your host, Anne, and disembodied hands, Quindy, along with her servitors, Justin and John. How are you all today? Ah, now I have to start coming up with, like, more creative intros. <laughs> I like the spooky Quindy. Ah. Oh, yuck, Karaniko. Yuck, yuck. Yeah, we had a really blustery day, blustery, blowy day yesterday at the start of our rain. So I feel that. We had horizontal rain yesterday. Kiki and I were out in it. We got very wet. Wait, here, I'll show you. I'll show you. So when we left the house, it was calm and just overcast. And then by the time we had gotten a quarter of the way through our walk, it was extremely blowy. One second. Let me get this here. Oh, I gotta get the video to go again. Here we go. Really blowy. Really, really blowy. And Kiki was like, uh, let's go home. <laughs> it was rainy. And then we both got soaked. So um, we were very both very soaked by the time we finally got home. And then I gave her a snuffle mat to uh, to uh, burn off some energy, and it became her wrestling mat. It's a good thing she's cute, because she's still a dingo. But yeah, there she is, snuggled up with her with her snuffle mat. Yes, she's much bigger now. Yes, oh yes. Yeah, you finally sent us rain. Good job. But yeah, the keekster has grown. She's uh she's like a 40 pound dog now. So we'll see uh I'm curious to see how big she'll get. Like she's she's pretty on par for Shiloh. The cutest dingo, yeah. It's the dingo outcross. Yeah, take more. I would like more. I actually really enjoy the fact that the first day of National Novel Writing Month they gave me a rainy day. Because it's just great to sit inside on days like this and just like work on my novel. So it was a perfect it was a perfect nano day, but the the dingo was very dingoey because she didn't get her full she didn't get her walk really. She didn't get a lot of it at all. So it didn't burn off any. Both ears are tilted in right now, but they'll straighten out when her when her growth plates close and her she stops teething and her head widens out a little bit. But yeah, the TP ears are real. It does make her adorable, however. Her back coat, her uh, coat on her back is so curly and, and like harsher now. It's funny. It'll loosen up as it comes in, but. All right, do you guys want to do, <clears throat> I was thinking about doing the red, getting the red back in shape here. Um, or we could do a bit of the armor. Do you guys have a question, or do you guys have a have an, have an opinion? Like, do, would you which would you rather have today? I'm giving you the option. I'm giving you the option. <laughs> armor. All right, I was gonna do black armor on this. You all ready for that? Let's see here. What do I want to do for that? So we have some options. We could go blue black with it. I wouldn't go nightmare. Um, it's too blue. Usually I use a mixture of blue liner and black. I could also use death knight black. Um, although it's not as strong pigment, it's not as strongly pigmented. Yeah, originally I was going to do this for the um, Patreon, but I thought I could still do kind of a step-by-step -step PDF for the $2 tier for the Patreon and do it here on the video and then tell people that, you know, they've got both. Ah, but I have to unclog my black because I never use it. Yes, I have a Patreon. Da -da -da. And yeah, I had planned I will be doing this, uh, the kind of the black NMM thing. Um as a as a short pdf for the patreon i think for the two dollar tier this month because that's something that got requested so
Black Armor is just touchy. I do like to still mix something into it, uh, just rather than having it just be flat black. So this, in this case, I'm doing four drops of, uh, I just had Besmara black to hand, so I'm using it. You could also use pure black. And then uh, two drops of blue liner. We'll see if that shifts it enough. I just want a little bit of something that isn't just pure black in there. And I find that like a really like gunmetal dark blue uh, blue black armor looks really good on vampires. Personally, I've always liked that combo. I didn't finish my tea this morning again, so I have it with me. So pardon my slurps. All right, and then we're gonna use pure white. And hopefully, I have other pure white over here. Yes, I do. Good. I was gonna say, I've got two bottles of pure white, both are pretty low. So I'm thinking for my color uh, workshop, I might do, um, I might also do a PDF, uh, kind of of the stuff we were talking about with the metallics on Halloween. Except with, a, I've gotten a couple more metallics in to play with, so. Thought I would do kind of a summary of the different kinds of metallics and uh, how they, uh, Brown liner. Yeah, I, I use brown liner or rogue shadow these days. Rogue shadow um, does have that reddish hue, and I do like that sometimes, depending on the model. So let's see here. Let's do this. I've got my my black and my white. Although my black has two drops of blue liner in it, and this is one of those cases where, um, as I mentioned the other day, I really do enjoy using blue liner as itself as a color, not as a liner. So we're gonna mix this up. And I'm going to pop it over here, a couple of big drops, and I'm going to drop some white in it after I mix up my white. But yeah, I actually ordered some metallic tube paints to see how those work, and uh, I ordered, uh, oh boy, what did I just order? Oh, a Turbo Dark Metallics to uh, play with those two. Thought I would do that as, a, as the $5 PDF this month. All right, so we've got a gray, and then I'm going to want to lighten that even further. Now, we're not going to have much room for a lot of this to highlight up, so we'll see how much farther we go. just mixing up a grayscale that's five steps so pen 10 and I'm hand mixing this instead of just reaching for grays because as mentioned I did put some uh, blue liner into it although it is showing up more uh, it's definitely showing up as more gray than blue but that's fine if I really wanted it to be blue I would have just gone with blue liner and maybe put a drop of black in it that would have given me I'll mix up that color to show you that so blue liner just with white is, hold on, doo, doo, doo. makes a very pretty color. Ah, there. So it's a, like a dark gunmetal blue. It doesn't have a ton of blue in it. If you want a dark blue that will go like a blue black that will go really blue when you add white to it then you want to deal with nightmare black maybe Ritterlick but uh, this is just a as you can see a slight blue so that's why I didn't color the uh, that's why I didn't color too much when we started adding white so blue liner is only faintly blue but it's still cold all right so maybe I'll use that color to highlight. Maybe I'll use the grays. We'll find out. Maybe we'll do a mix of both. Yeah, I was the I was gonna make the Inuit snow comment as well. Funny. 
Funny, funny. All right. Hello, armor. Well then. We will definitely be using some of our uh, our black mix, uh, more than a little of it. So I'm going to actually keep my white highlight there that I kind of put in with my Xena. And I'm going to paint everything else, this mixture of Besmara and blue liner. But I'm going to keep my, my highest highlights there. push this out of the way so that we have a bit more realistic here but yeah how is everybody how's your November going how was your I had a very good day yesterday finished my nano goal actually did a little more than you need to do 1667 words a day to finish at uh, 50,000 words for the month of NaNoWriMo for National Novel Writing Month and I did uh, 1750 ish which is nice I need to make sure to update my, my writing tracker. All right, now this, this area is interesting because it's got kind of a peak. And I think whenever you've got something that comes to a peak and has a, has a, you know, kind of an angle down the middle, even if you've got it, if you've got a straight overhead light source, choose choose a little bit like which angle you want to go lighter and which angle you want to go darker with so in this case i've decided on my little shield here to go lighter from this direction uh, so that's what i'm going to do i'm going to put my all black over here more or less i'm going to go slightly lighter on some of this But I'm still going to go really dark over there. I'm just uh, taking it easy right now. I'm just reminding myself I'm going to do it. Make sure that I've got black on this. I may change that, actually, because... Hmm, we'll see. We'll see. Because everything's going to be very dim over here. And even though this side is going to be lighter, we still need it to be mostly black. That's the thing about black NMM, guys, is um, it, the rule still holds true that if you want something to look black, most of the surface has to be black. So you still have to follow that rule with NMM. Let's see here. Making sure we have a lot of black in there. But I do like to not cover over the zenith entirely. I do need do like to keep um, my highest highlights where I've outlined them there at least a little bit I come back and can come back and re uh, reaffirm them but I need to really cover over a lot of this um, so you wanted it not to be black but you just wanted it to be a dark gray then you just have the black very close to the white highlight and you would uh, just go with her, your blue gray or whatever you're going to use I think I've done silver NMM in past uh, streams. I don't remember. Yeah, I think I did silver on the Duelist. Or steel. Like, if you want a dark steel, though. Like, it's just whatever your basic color is, you're going to be highlighting and, and shading with the rules of NMM. And so, yeah, the only thing you change is your color your color, your pentad that you're using. But the rules stay the same. So you have to have a highest highlight, you have to have a dark shadow, and you've got to have an under reflection for reflected light. 
those are the rules. We must stick to the rules. All right, and I think that's a belt. And that's an armor. <sighs> but I mean, you can make any color of like steel or dark steel using a blue gray or a dark blue gray. Just remember that if you, when you do your under reflection, if you overwhelm too much of that area, it's going to lighten it. So doing a dark NMM can be difficult because you have to still put in highlights, but you've got to remember uh, to limit the size of them. We'll do this side. And I'm going to make the entire inside of this leg. Whenever you've got like there, here the greaves are definitely like there's a line down the middle, like they're they're tented, they're like a triangle. So the inside is dark, and the inside may not even get a reflection at that point. Or if it does, it might be red, if I can fit it in. See, this is where, like, working on a 28 millimeter does limit us again. If this was a 54 millimeter model or a 75, I would have a lots of room for that reflection in between the cloth and the leg. But because I'm working on a very small model, um, Sophie Silver, that's why I don't like it, Brother Raymond. Sophie Silver is a novelty color, okay? And when I say novelty color, I mean it doesn't have very many applications. It's not actually a silver. It is a clear base with a blue flake and white pigment. So the flake is blue. It is not silver. And that's why it's just, it's kind of a novelty color. It's really good for, like, unicorns and little hells. <laughs> It's uh, I, it's not my favorite. Let's just put it that way. And that's saying a lot. Like, actually, I really don't like the color because it's confusing. We did it as kind of just a fun experiment to see, um, you know, it looked kind of cool. But then because there's not a lot of instructions with Reaper Master Series or, you know, other than a tons of PDFs with specific models and specific colors, but not a lot of localized, like centralized knowledge, sorry. Um, it just confuses people. Yeah, white pigment, blue flake. So it's an iridescent blue with white pigment. It's weird. It's just weird. So if you put it over a dark color, you're going to see the blue flake come out. Although the white pigment is still going to, you know, somewhat be there but it's just uh it's like a pearl white with blue flake it's kind of crazy so i'm just going to leave that highlight down the middle right now um he has puffy pants and i haven't decided how to deal with the puffy pants yet let's look at his concept art that quindy was nice enough to um to send me hold on while i grab that one second must grab concept art for that must grab discord Let's see. Arg, Discord, don't give me ads. Don't care about ads. Um, Quindy. There we go. So there's Dude. So we're inverting his color scheme. So now we can see that the, that thing in the front is actually a pouch. Um, that's hooked over his uh, dagger. And yeah, it's not real evident where the, like the belt is kind of a silver jewelry piece in here, but that's not sculpted on here. So I'm just going to keep this uh, kind of center plate. There's kind of a center plate here. 
We're just going to keep that as a belt. And then there's armor, and there's more cloth, and uh, let's see here. Yeah, poofy pants. There they are. We can see the poofy pants. Um, I don't, it's not, I wouldn't actually do it over a black base, Brother Raymond. I'm sorry, that's confusing. Dark color. Um, it's not going to work. This is the problem. It's not going to work great over a black base because of the white pigment. It's probably going to look streaky. So really what I would put it over is like something like this, a blue gray. Maybe even that, although you won't get much of a shine, but I would do it something over something like this if you're going to use it. It's just, yeah, it's it's really, like I said, it's a novelty color. Um, I would use it for very specific instances. I wouldn't use it as a general silver. But yeah, I would use it over a blue-gray, like Twilight Blue or that Carbon Scoring Blue. But yeah, I would not put it over a black base, sorry. Dark color. But I think the white pigment, and this is why I say it's kind of a funky color, and why I'm not a fan is that it's it's very like there's just so few applications. I mean, most people at Paint Club knew that I hated this color. <laughs> we had one person at Paint Club who loved it, absolutely loved it, and like I was just like, grr. <laughs> All right, well, the problem with the poofy pants is now I have to decide what I'm going to do with them. So I'm at least going to probably come in and sketch to bring them more into uh, nice and busy. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's the problem with Sophie Silver. It's just, it's so. It doesn't know what it wants to be. It really is just an experiment color that can be kind of cool for a special effect, but I wouldn't like use it for NMM. It doesn't have the coverage and it's, uh, and it's not silver enough. Does that make sense? So I'm just going to put some black lines in there so that I can get these poofs to stand out. Um, there's not much room between the poofs. Like the poofs are kind of, uh, like I, I can, all I can see are poofs. I can't really see in between the poofs. So it's probably just going to be, maybe I'll alternate them in color. And I may need those poofs because uh, in the concept art, it's red on the outer poofs and gold on the inner. And uh, since this, I was planning on making the shoulder pad here gold, just like in the concept art, I am going to need to repeat that gold around the model. So poofy pants are an option as far as introducing a bit of gold. Uh, as lo as well as some of the like the dagger and stuff. So, but yeah. And the problem with Sophie Silver Double is that you can't use it as a highlight as a silver like over steel like you would with a with a real silver because the flake is wrong, so it won't look right. So yeah, it really is a novelty color, just for kind of special effects stuff. Like I said, I knew somebody who would like loved it, who would use it in wacky circumstances, but that doesn't mean, yeah, it's, that's the exception. You can use it, actually, the one one thing that it would be excellent for. Here, let me give you this, actually. The thing that it would be excellent for, Brother Raymond, is in highlighting, if you use it to highlight the sparkling blue metallic, 9104. So if you take sparkling blue and say you're painting a blue dragon or something, or like a magical blue armor, um... Like if you're a fan of the um, the uh, books from um, uh, the Stormlight uh, Archive from uh, Brandon Sanderson, uh, Adeline's armor is uh, his shard plate is blue, metallic blue. Uh, so you could put the metallic blue down, and then you could highlight it 
with Sophie Silver. You could actually mix Sophie Silver into it and it would become, it would mix highlights pretty decently. So you could actually do that. And because the flakes are the same, this is the thing with highlighting metallics is except for very rare instances, you want your flakes to be in harmony. The exception is when you're using a pearl white, you're mixing a pearl white into a, into a color like will usually give you a decent effect. Even with gold, it'll just make a paler gold, even though you're using also a white flake with the gold flake. So not ideal, but it works. Um, and pearl white is useful in highlighting um, the blue, the sparkling blue, but Sophie Silver is better because the, the flakes match. Does that make sense? All right, so I'm going to underpaint this a bit. Sorry, got distracted. Need to need to do something with the poofy pants or I'm going to be really annoying, annoyed. It's like uh, I need to sharpen up my details now that I know what they are. And then we go back and do the armor. Yeah, I mean, you can use it all, all sorts of, and that's what most people do use it for, Crows, is is just for frosty winter minis, you know, for just a little bit of sparkle on snow, stuff like that. It's fine for that. It's just my least favorite color that we've ever done. I am biased against, so by all means, embrace your love of Sophie Silver if you have a love of Sophie Silver. But I did want to caution Brother Raymond and how, you know, how it is how it is useful or not useful alrighty poofy pants are more or less more or less kind of defined now on that side poofy pants now need to be tackled on this side Oh, and my eyes are tearing like fiercely. I even like close the window, mostly. Winter eyeball teariness. Don't like it. Fall allergies. All right, so over here. Kind of looking. The poofs over here are actually more well-defined. Makes me wonder if there was a casting, a bit of a casting thing with the other side. Like, mm. Yeah, there's space in between, but just barely. So if I try to get the, if I try to put a color in between the big poofs, I'm gonna have to kind of paint plastic surgery it. And I'm just dropping things I don't want to drop. So one second. There we go. <laughs> I take mine in the evening. So I sleep better overnight. Yep, allergy crap. Alrighty. Just come in here and try to define this a little bit better. There we are. All right. Stripey pants now defined on both sides. Thank you, stripey pants. Okay, and I think that's armor there and there. I think that's pretty much all armor. Going to check that again. 
All right, so yeah, we've got, they've alternated the armor color here, but this is still armor, that's still armor, and I'll have to decide. This looks like it's meant to be cloth, but it's actually sculpted more like armor on the piece. Um, and so I'll have to figure out what I want to do in there. It's all black though. All of it's black in my version. All right. And it's not really sculpted as scales, it's sculpted more as extra small ridges. Yeah, I mostly close my window also because it is getting cold out, but partially to try to cut off the allergens. Um, I do like to have it uh, have fresh air back here. This is an old house, so it has old house smell going on, which is nice sometimes, but I like the fresh air in the morning, so I have it cracked open a little bit, but regretting that with my allergies not uh, really getting... Uh, being great. Apparently all it takes is a tiny amount of uh, tree mung to uh, activate Anne's allergies. All right, and we've got some parts under here. Now, I, this part actually didn't get primed. See that, that point right there? This is not a big deal. Just paint it black. You don't even have to use black primer. Um, or paint it whatever. Because the thing is, this is a little tiny recessed area. You can't touch it at all with your finger. Like you have to poke your brush in there to get it. So you don't have to use primer because it's never gonna rub off because nobody's ever gonna be able to touch it. <laughs> so unless somebody pokes it in there, pokes their, pokes something in there, it, you don't have to actually use primer there. You can just paint it. Primer is important in preventing rub off, but if you miss a part with your priming, then it's not actually important to use primer. All right, so down here, technically, that's kind of a flat edge. That's a, some of these are really difficult to do with NMM, but this is kind of rounded, so I can probably just do a line down the middle, and that's probably what I'm gonna do with the piece above it. So I have to figure out my highlights here. And just do two lines. There's a bit of shadow here underneath the pouch, so I'm, I'm leaving some dark space there. I want to skinny down this uh, highlight that I just put on, make it a little thinner. And then we've got a little bit of, uh, we don't really get any light on this plate except for reflected light. So uh, again, there's a spot in here where primer didn't get. So I'm gonna pop a bunch of black paint into that. But yeah, this curved piece under the arm, it's really not gonna get any light except reflected light. So it wants a light gray. And I'm gonna reduce that actually because I don't want uh, too much. So I'm throwing some black in there to darken it down. But yeah, it's also, I guess I the other reason my window is slightly open is that it's still, even when it's cold here, it's not like super cold. So I think today's just in the 50s. So just a little bit of highlight there on the bottom of that plate. I might bring up some, because uh, it's a curved plate, I might actually bring up a little bit of highlight right along where it curves, just to bring up a little, little bit right here, see if I can make it show up better. 
Whenever a plate curves, you've got to treat it as part of a cylinder. Because if, just imagine that plate wrapping around the whole model, it would be going in, you know, it would make a cylinder, right, wrapped around. So it's a little better getting that, that highlight up there. So when I've got a change of direction, the light source is going to reflect differently. And mostly learning to do NMM and learning where you want your reflections and what kind of lighting and reflections you want. It, it just takes practice. It takes painting a bunch of models and looking at a bunch of metal and looking at a bunch of other people's miniatures as well. If you, there's somebody who you know who does amazing NMM, then uh, by all means, like look at their models, use that as reference, kind of wrap your brain around. Do keep in mind that not all mini painters are uh, painting NMM very realistically. A lot of the time they may uh, decide to take it more of a stylistic um, bent, so it may not always be like correct as far as like realism, but uh, that doesn't really matter as long as it looks cool and you like it. Some people may call you out on it, but then that's just not their style. And I think that's useful to remember is that most painters who aren't like necessarily like the, who don't have a lot of experience with critiques or who just aren't really focusing on what makes a good critique. A lot of painters uh, may assess your work from the perspective of their own and the style that they like. Um, so always take criticism with a grain of salt and keep in mind that that person's style may be very different from yours and that the criticism that they level, if it requires you to change your style to, uh, to accommodate may just not, you know, be criticism that you need to listen to. Because uh, if they're like, that's not very realistic, but you were going for more of a stylistic um, design approach, then, well, that's not really a valid, you know, it's not really a critique that that is much use to you. So if you can, when you ask somebody to tell you what they think, if you're really interested in improving, tell us exactly what you want critique on. Um, you're more likely to get a critique on that, for one thing. When you just put a model up online on, say, the Discord, uh, and you're like, what do you think? You know, a lot of people may just not have the energy to, like, do an in-depth critique. But if you're like, I'm working on the, uh, the breastplate, the NMM on the breastplate, what do you think? you're more likely to get people who will take just a minute because that doesn't, doesn't take very long, right? That's a specific thing that they can look at. It doesn't take too much brain power or energy pennies out of their day. And uh, so you're much more likely to get useful critique when you are specific about what you would like critique on. This applies at conventions too when you go up to a painter who you admire and ask if you say I specifically want you to look at my leather treatment on the boots then that painter is going to have something that their poor tired brain can latch onto, and you're more likely to get a good valuable valuable critique. Going in to hit um, quite a bit of highlight there on the kneecap uh, I'm going to knock it back. Often it is much easier when doing dark NMM to over highlight at first and then to uh, bring your black in and kind of knock it down. Yeah, I know sometimes when I, when I get online and people are like, you know, just looking for general critique, I might not have the energy at that time and I might I don't just bypass that you know rather than giving a lot of critique because to give critique to give useful critique takes time right it takes time and energy that you could be using for something else you should always very much appreciate people who do take the time and energy to critique your work when you ask for it online 
because they could have been doing something else with their day. They could have been painting their own miniatures, right, for the time that they took. So So there we got our little skull and it's uh it's very shiny. It's uh, definitely not black, but uh we'll work on that. I wanted to get it kind of defined. I'm still going to bring in a couple extra highlights on it. So you can do this kind of dark gray treatment on it until it looks kind of NMM-y, and then you can do a black glaze over the whole thing to knock it down. So I'm going to try to get to the point where it's reading well for me. And I like doing this sort of complex shape with non-metallic metals. David hates it. But I think it's fun. So Kiki has a vet appointment tomorrow because our pet insurance wants a orthopedic exam on her in order to essentially, you know, if you don't get the orthopedic exam, then your dog's not covered if they come up with hip dysplasia down the road. But I have to wonder how effective this really is in screening. Because I'm like, they're not asking for x-rays, but they're asking the vet to assess if the dog has hip dysplasia just by manipulating the joint. It seems a little bit wonky. <laughs> so I kind of wonder how effective that actually is for them. But yeah, you know. I also wonder if they don't require this for all breeds, but only like breeds they think are high risk, like shepherds. It's kind of funky. I mean, I believe in pet insurance because it really saved us when Kiri got cancer. Like if you are unlucky and your pup comes up with a serious health condition, it can really save you. So I do believe in it. But, uh, but yeah, that the orthopedic exam thing is just kind of like, hmm, hmm, okay. No, um, so we breed against it. Like we have a breeding program that tackles hip dysplasia and tries to reduce it, Pendrake, but um, you can't do hip and elbow x-rays until the dog is a certain age. Uh, although there's some argument that you could do, like one of the x-ray types, pen hip, um, has shown that they get pretty good results even on a six month old pup, but it's still uh, most uh, hip x-rays like OFA hip x-rays won't actually give you a permanent grade until the dog is two years old. You can get a preliminary score before that, but they understand that as the dog ages, the joints change, right? So, but yeah, so Shiloh is what we do is we x-ray not just breeding dogs, but also litter mates. Uh, so we try to x-ray every single puppy, even pets, because that's where you're going to find out where hip dysplasia is lurking in the carrier's. Because if you only ever, do, if you do what most breeds do, and you x-ray just the breeding animals, because hip dysplasia is such a complex disease and because it's recessive, your dog, the breeding dog, could come up with an excellent rating and you could think, oh, I'm awesome, you know, I'm home free. But what you didn't know is that if you had had that dog's litter mates x-rayed, maybe two out of four would have been dysplastic. And if you had had that information, you would have known, oh, my dog isn't safe, even though it's got an excellent score, it's very likely to throw this disease. Um, and what that does is it just uh, it gives you more information to choose the best breeding matches, right? If you're breeding for health. So that's what we do is we, uh, we x-ray as many dogs. And there are still owners who are just kind of like, eh, we don't want to, you know? And uh, I mean, there's really nothing you can do in that case as a breeder except shrug and be sad. Um, but uh, for the most part, 
Uh, as long as you can get like 75% or more of the litter mates, you're getting a pretty good cross section. And then we, yeah, we utilize that. We, we keep track of when a puppy is dysplastic and when a litter mate of a breeding dog comes up with dysplasia, we uh, increase their risk numbers as far as uh, their possibility of throwing the disease. Um, and we run these disease risks on all matches before they're approved. Um, it depends on whether you're doing a, like what color is your NMM? Uh, so uh, let me see if I have something I can illustrate with that's bigger and not as, hmm, one second. One second, Hangerhead, you've got a very good question. And I want to see if I have something that I can illustrate with that might be a bit larger. But I tend not to do NMM on really big stuff. So, see, and it's different too because it's like when you've got a really intricate NMM, like I'm doing on her hip area here, um, you you have to break it up a lot. Okay, so, hmm. So what I'm going to say is, let's just look at her hip for a second. You can see here that I'm working on this, and I've got a large, the mid-tone, the base coat is uh, is more of a shadow. But but this is really the mid-tone here, right? This, this brownish, uh, medium dark brownish gold color. So you can see that you're still having to keep a lot of that color in this area because you need it to for the, everything to look gold. So the, the surface thing, I always call this surface control, and it's just my own term for it. Other people call it different things, hang your head. But for a surface to look a given color, it's got to stay at least 50% that color. Often it needs to stay more than 50% that color, if, like if you're dealing with black. But with most colors, you need to get about 50% needs to be around this honey gold color, right? So here you've got on this upper surface, we've got a lot of honey gold. We've got just a little bit near the bottom of it here and here, down here. We've got a color that's very close, right? You can see it. So when we take all of this, at least 50% of the surface stays that gold color. My white highlights are going to be very small in spot on something intricate like this. You can see that I'm edging with white. So there's really not a way to assess how much of the surface is taken up. But usually it depends on how shiny your NMM is. This is where it comes in with it depends. Um, because if your NMM is not super shiny, like if you're working with more of a burnished or satin surface to the metal, think about like brass doorknobs or, or light fixtures, right? Where they tend to be more of a satiny fixture. They're not super, super shiny. In that case, your highlights are actually going to diffuse. They're going to become a lot more broad and they're going to blend in more. Whereas for the shiniest surfaces, you're really only doing tiny spot white highlights. Um, and you can see kind of spot, I'm, I'm expanding this. This is not necessarily, this is not super shiny. This is not chrome. Uh, so you see my whites are actually a little bit more than just spots. So this is kind of, kind of in the middle. And then you see my shadows here are also pretty small. The shadow probably, the shadow takes up a little more room than the highlight just because the shadow tends to blend more um, into things. So it's like, and I can't really give you like, like it's very hard to do what you mentioned, evenly distributed. So your highlights are almost never evenly distributed, except if you're painting a satin surface. So what you really need to get around your head around um, with NMM is the degree of shininess that you reach for is probably going to depend on what exactly you're doing, whether you're doing a big, broad, open area or you're doing a lot of intricate area in NMM. So if you're doing uh, if you're doing a lot of intricate area, you know, you, you could go with just the tiny spot highlights or you could make them a little broader like I am to pick up the light a little better. Um, but it's it's your highlights are are seldom gradient gradiented like that. Your highlight is usually Hold on while I hold your while I read your next post. 
Yeah, it looked like stone probably because your pure white highlight wasn't a spot you had a blend in. Um, it's placement. Okay, so I talked about highlight, um, shadow, and under reflection. So let's take this, let's take this breastplate, this plate, because it's really big and it's pretty simple. It's not, not, um, doesn't have a, an angle down the middle like a lot of this. So I've got my bright highlight. I've got my base color black, right? So if, if this was not super shiny, and it is pretty flat. I'm just making sure that it's flat. Mm, it might be a little rounded. Grr. Anyway, we'll just illustrate anyway. So your highlight is always going to be pretty spot or pretty small. Like, let's say that there is a, a little bit of a divot down the front of this because there might be a bit of a curve just like here. I'm not blending in this, really. It's a very small white highlight. And I really don't want it to, I don't want a gradient out from here. What I actually need is a shadow in between that highlight and the rest of the uh, reflections. So I'm going to show you kind of, man, there's so much to NMM. I'm just going to block this out because I don't like it. One second. Grr. There's no place good on this guy to really show a simple, well, maybe. Maybe on a totally different model. All right. So this is David's work. And I'm going to steal it. I'm going to steal David's model for this because at least it's got bigger, broader things. All right. So you have to think about where light is falling. When you're looking at the model from the top and you're looking, and this is a work in progress, so it's pretty rough. But when you're looking at the model from the top, everything is going to be like kind of mid-tone up. Like you can see the mid-tone here, but you can see a lot of bright, right? A lot of bright because the light is falling directly on it. But as you turn it, a lot of these highlights are going to cut off pretty abruptly. And what I would typically do here is I would put, and it depends, but you'll see a shadow as he's put a shadow right under that. I would even darken down that shadow and make it harder. So the shinier an area is, the tighter it's going to be between your highlight and your shadow. But you always need that highlight, shadow, and then a reflection. You can get this in your head by looking at a paintbrush in the light. So looking at the paintbrush, I'm going to put my hand underneath it. You see, uh, it's a cylinder, yeah, but just kind of look at it. You see the top, which has a, a light, and then you see a band of shadow, and then you see the brightest highlight, which is essentially reflecting the light toward your eyes. And then you see another shadow, and then you see highlight where I, my hand is underneath reflecting the light up at the brush. So this is the kind of thing that you need to get in head for your NMM. But you can see that the under the brightest highlight is the darkest shadow, right? You see that? Because the shadow that's on the upper part of the brush isn't as dark as that. And this is key with NMM. Now, this is a very shiny surface. This is essentially a chrome. Um, this brush would count as chrome because that's how shiny it is. So this is the extreme where you don't have any blends at all and you just see lines. So you've got no blending. But that highlight followed by the shadow followed by the under reflection is the thing to remember. And even on the top, you're going to have a shadow, but it's going to be more the mid-tone. So the top, the very top can still be pure white. You just can't see it right now. It's, it's aimed toward the light. Then there's like a little bit more of a darker highlight that you do see. And then there's a shadow that's more like mid-tone. Then there's a super bright highlight and then a super dark shadow and then an under reflection. And the reason the under reflection isn't blending into that dark shadow is because this is a shiny surface. If you have a satiny surface, it would blend in. And it would be broader because it's blending in. So like, everything is curved, grr. So like here, let's just, I don't have David's grays right now. So like here, like highlight at the top, probably highlights here. Spot highlight here, maybe to, to kind of define that area. Underneath that, there's gonna be a shadow. Remember, brightest highlight, darkest shadow under it. 
This is this is very simple, by the way, and it does. There's so many ways that this varies on the different shapes, but in general, darker shadow, and then it'll blend up to uh, an area with more reflection, and you'll have a little bit more light down here because this edge is going to catch the light. Even on this area here, I'm going to put in a dark shadow right under on these edge here. Gonna blend that up a little. But the key with that MM is figuring out where your light is coming from and where it's going to hit. And that's where your bright highlight is. But you should not be really blending your highlights much. Like your, your bright highlights need to stay pretty small. And so if your NMM is looking like, like stone, what you're missing is your dark shadow. What you haven't yet understood is that you need a dark shadow underneath that light to make it appear like here on his skulls that I just did. What do I have? I've got a lighter tone here on the top of the skull, bright, bright highlight, really dark shadow. Over here, we've got kind of a middle highlight and we've got a dark shadow. Then it comes up to another highlight. Then it comes up to a really dark shadow underneath that. Then the jawline down here and the teeth are picking up some highlight. This is all very general. Like I said, it changes. It's different on cylinders and spheres and like the, the shapes change. Uh, different on flat areas is different on angled areas. Yeah, for the most part, yeah. And again, if you've got a satin surface, then you do get a little bit of blending with your highlight. Um, into your shadow and stuff. I really wish I had a better example model, but I don't <coughs> at this time. But like here, I'm keeping everything lighter where it's light, but then look here. So, so this area, we've got, it's lighter. It's up toward the, toward the sky, right? Toward the light. You've got this bright edge highlight. Then you've got this dark shadow. Then you've got edge highlights and you know a bit more here i'm being very stylistic but it's still the rules are still being followed here we've got bright highlight and then underneath it see those tiny touches of dark shadow so and then i'm blended up where you're going to see your blended highlight is where you're getting your under reflection highlights so light that is reflecting from the environment is going to be like this light down here you'll see it blending in things like that but here we're still dealing with the top part of the model and we've got that bright highlight. We're going to have a dark shadow underneath it. This is all like not done yet. So, but anyway, it looked like that when it started. But you always need that pop of bright white, whether it's on an edge or, or whatever. And the thing that's going to let you know whether you need like a long a line or a, a tiny spot is both the surface, the surface's shape and the uh, level of shininess of the surface. And this is something that honestly I could, I could, if I had a, a day long class, if I had eight hours to like take you through this, I could really like explain it and like stand over your shoulder and you'd, you'd probably get it by the end. Um, but on this stream, I'm very limited. <laughs> but yeah, everybody that I've ever seen whose NMM looks like stone is not understanding the bright highlight with the dark shadow. They're just doing blends, but they don't understand that you, you need that bright and shadow right next to each other or very close to get the effect of shiny. You won't get the effect of shiny without those things next to each other. You still need the shadows, Pendrake. You still need the, the highlight and the shadow. Even on the tiniest little... Do we have tiny NMM? One second. Like, this is more of a burnished NMM on the Corgi. So even there, I'm trying, here it's in bands. See, this is what I mean when I say it gets complicated depending on how your surfaces are, right? This is a very satin surface. So I've got a highlight and then I've got the shadow around it and then I'm blending up toward under reflection. I'm trying to see if I've got, I know I've got itty bitty and a moment up here. Yeah, I do, hold on. So with itty bitty and a mem on a 20 millimeter, 28 millimeter, you're gonna be very much, um, very much generalizing. But here you can see bright highlight, dark shadow, under reflection. Bright highlight, dark shadow. Got it? Bright highlight, dark shadow on the inside of the leg because it's a cylinder. Under reflection is slightly lighter down here and it's blended in more. 
top of the leg is all lighter because that's where the light is falling. See it? Bright highlight, darker shadow, under reflection. Bright highlight, dark shadow, little divot, under reflection. Got it? I'm trying to think. Cylinders are a little bit wonky, but here you get it. Bright highlight, dark shadow, under reflection. Uh, even kind of uh, half, half, uh, half asked it back here, but here on the shoulder you can see everything on the top is lighter, but you still get that bright edge highlight, that white, boom, boom, then the dark shadow, then that bottom edge is catching the light. Got it? Cylindrical, cylindrical stuff changes, rounded stuff changes. You might then just get a catch of the light where the whole thing turns. It's all... Uh, see anything else when you have a cylinder like this bright highlight dark shadow under reflection and all of its lighter on top see that's like the simplest way to break it down but then as you paint different models with different shapes of metal it's infinite like it's infinite it really is it's just really complex and, uh, and you'll be feeling your way for a while, but just kind of keep those rules in mind and keep in mind where your light source is coming from because you have to be consistent with where your light source is coming from for NMM to work. And that can be a diffused light source from above like a lot of us do on miniatures. It's perfectly valid, but then you have to keep that in mind for every surface that you're doing. Then you have to treat the cylinder and the handle as two separate shapes. Just ignore, ignore the handle, paint the cylinder, ignore the cylinder, paint the handle. And sometimes you gotta slow down and just, slow down and just walk your way through it. Like kind of little tiny step by step. But yeah, there is no magic percentages. There is only how bright is your light source? How, uh, how shiny is your shiny surface? Is it a satin? Is it chrome? Is it somewhere in between? The shininess is going to determine how much blending you do. So here, I'm going to be popping up a highlight. Going to have a dark shadow. Going to have an under reflection blended up. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that's true. Like, yeah, because it really is like, there's only like four shapes, but even then, um, sorry, is it Hal? Haley. Haley. Um, even then, even if you can break it down to those four shapes, then it's going to change as you tilt those shapes with respect to your light sourcing. So yeah, those rules will still apply, but you've got to often still think about it. But yeah, so it's it's just, it's infinitely interesting. I mean, NMM can be a real pleasure when you nail it. I have my, I don't think I have her here. Um, I had a Paladin. I was doing Sky Earth NMM. That's Chrome essentially on. And that sucker, that even like was a trial for me because there were all sorts of details and uh, small details and big sections and I had to think about the reflectivity of all sections. It was uh, crazy. I put her I put her in the other room because I was like I am not I do not have enough oomph for this right now. She's a competition piece and sometimes you just don't have the energy. So I'll do more blending down here and I'll do more of a spot highlight up there on this edge. So that, uh, so that, but I still need a lot of black. There. Yeah, simple dagger or sword is a good way to start. Probably the best way. Um, let me see if I have pictures of Paladin somewhere. I haven't worked on her for a while. Oh, 
there we go. So this is my Lion Paladin where I was working with the Chrome. So all of this, stopping and figuring out where your reflections will be. Like you can see the work in progress, but you can see, see that I'm still doing a thing. Um, I still have the bright highlight. I still have the dark shadow under it. And down here, although you can't see it in this picture, there is definitely a reflection on the underside. So it's always, you're always still doing that. Like this is a really um, difficult model to do, but you're still going to be, you're still going to be dealing with those same ideas. Oh, and even with here, you've got the bright light that comes right up to the edge of this dark shadow. And then you've got more shadow, more reflections. So yeah, this was an early stage. But in order to figure it out, I actually had to put the model under a bright light because this arm guard was driving me crazy. Just to see, just to, I, I base coated it gray and then I put it under the light at the angle that I wanted the, um, the reflections to be. And then I essentially made a note of it. I kept this photo. And then when I went in, I started blocking in those shapes. And then I started blocking in more of the, the skylight. And this is something you can do. And then I started blocking in some of my surroundings. And then I went back in and refined that. And again, here, notice uh, it's all lighter, even though, though it's like sky and, and forest, right? But it's still lighter. And this comes up eventually to a pure white. Dark shadow under reflection. You've got to have it. And there's more that I did beyond this. I don't know yet. That's the last picture in that series. But but that's how I tackled that because that was... Uh, oh, and here's a close-up of an earlier work on the shoulder before I blended all that. So, yeah. So that's the hardest... Um, that's the hardest NMM is this guy with this chrome, essentially. I don't know. Yeah, they're okay. I do have a picture of the under reflection. So there we go. So that's how that ended up is you can see the top edge does have a highlight, lighter, white, our surroundings, dark shadow, under reflection, including reflecting the red here because it has to if it's that shiny. Um, out here, it's a cylinder and it's facing forward and slightly up. So you're going to have your light and then your dark shadow and then your reflection on the outside edge. Same over here. See? So you can essentially take that and the shinier the surface, the harder it gets. So most of us paint our miniatures more as if it's something between satin and... Uh, here we go. Duelist. Something between a satin and a chrome. So here, breastplate's a great example. Everything facing upward is a lighter gray, hot white highlight here, but it's blended in because I wanted this to be more burnished surface. Dark shadow, under reflection, dark shadow, and then this turns into a different shape. So this is what I'm saying when, it, when you have different shapes, right? Because these are round, breastplate is round, until you get down here, then it's actually uh, a cylinder. It's just a cut off cylinder. If it went all the way around her torso, it would be a cylinder and it's curved. So then you've gotten your light in the middle with your dark shadows on the sides and your side reflections. And then on these edges, you're doing your own little thing. Highlight, shadow, highlight, shadow, reflection, right? So every surface changes. And even if you have that whole, you know, hey, there's only four shapes really you have to worry about thing, as you can see, depending on your light sourcing and depending on if that surface is curved, like, eh, it, it can be a little harder. You still can follow the rules. Like here, this leg is definitely tilted backwards. So you have a highlight here, you have a shadow here, and then these come up slowly. The cylinder comes up slowly instead of being um, right there. So there you go. So sometimes you generalize a little more on uh, 28 mil. Highlight, shadow, uh, under reflection. This is very, very sketched in and very... Uh, because it's such a small model. And it, it, uh, you can use video game references when you're looking at sometimes stuff like this. You'll even see it on this one. This is very shiny metal, so you're gonna see it uh, just like on the brush, on the chrome, you're gonna see a highlight, shadow, and highlight on every finger. 
Over here even though, you see a highlight, but then you see a little band of shadow, and then there's another highlight. It doesn't go up as high, but it's there. And that's because that finger is, you know, tucked in. This one is more in the light. So you see this even in, you see it in video game renderings, you see it in uh, actual armor out on the field, stuff like that. I think that's all I've got as far as metal on here, at least in this area. Just making sure that I'm not missing anything. Yeah, pretty much. Beware looking at jewelry pieces for reference because they're usually um, photoed in a soft box. And that means the light is diffused. All right, yeah, I think that's it. Cool. Good thing I keep pictures, huh? Yeah, usually, and they do often cheat. You are correct, Ark. But the best of them are pretty good if you need to just kind of start to wrap your head around it. Um, like often, the thing about video games is, is they do tend to complexify stuff also sometimes. There's a lot of scattering. There's a lot of like secondary light sourcing and color reflection and crap. At least when I look at my Overwatch mo uh, stuff, that, that seems to be the case. Um, yeah, the model doesn't reflect on itself, yeah, most of the time. So you do have to still keep things in mind. But what I find video games can be good for is imagining light sources, like the, the primary light source on a curved or weird surface. It's like sometimes you can use those. I tend to try to use real world references. I have lot, plenty of photos from the Renaissance Fair and I own a sword. So if I do need to go out and take a picture of a sword in sunlight, I can, um, you know. Yeah, so, but this is, this is, my rules are like general simple rules that are not perfect, but they should keep you mostly out of trouble. That's kind of why I formulated them. They are not like, because I would rather like, rather than giving you 60 zillion examples of the ways you can paint NMM, I would rather give you that basic highlight, shadow, reflection, and then have you like iterate on it. Like that, that empowers you, I think more, because otherwise you're gonna be looking for a specific photo to paint a specific object. Whereas if you have the highlight shadow and under reflection in your head, you can tr make a run at painting anything and you may have to tweak it afterwards. I still have to tweak stuff after I paint it, but you'll, you'll at least be in the right general geography. <laughs> but yeah, um, going to Renaissance fairs or museums with armor collections is, uh, again, you have to kind of watch what the lighting is. Sometimes the lighting is from several directions and so it won't be as useful. But if you keep that in mind, um, you can still get some good ideas. Uh, Renaissance fairs I find is better just because it's usually outdoors in a booth. And so I get a lot more useful reflections. I've showed my ref a few of my reference photos in past, um, uh, past streams. And always, yeah, always I'm just like kind of looking at that and saying, okay, you know, how, how unnecessarily complex or simple did I, you know, make this when I did it? So then, ah, so this breastplate is actually a little bit, a little bit curved. And so I have to take that into effect. If it was flat, I could get away with that edge highlight, but it's not, it is slightly curved. So that means I need to take a little bit of highlight. And like I said, you know, I often, uh, I often have to kind of adjust after the fact to whatever I'm doing. Hey there, Daffod Weir. We just had a long uh, protracted uh, NMM question and answer discussion. You missed it, but that's okay. It's on VOD. It's on VOD and then it'll be on YouTube. I'm gonna get an underside. So yeah, I find that um, surfaces reflecting like, like what I did on the Paladin where the red of the cloth was reflecting in the armor. You can do some of that. Um, I did a little of it. I didn't, I think I adjusted it on the duelist afterwards, but uh, I did do a little bit more after I, uh, after I took that picture of the duelist model. Um, I made some of the red from the bricks that she's standing on, the cobbled street, reflect on the underside of her greaves. 
Um, that's the kind of thing it, you can do very limitedly in 28. If you think about the scale here, you wouldn't see a lot of that very much unless it was really strong. So like here, this should definitely be a red highlight. Like when we get down to this area, any light hitting here is probably going to be reflected red. Um, and any under any reflection light down here, like the white light will go straight down the front, but any reflection here is going to be red. But there's so little time, there's so little room to actually portray that on a 28 millimeter that a lot of people just don't because it tends to make the surface look crowded and not correct. Okay, have fun, Crowley. <laughs> you need to think too much, yeah. After a while, it becomes second nature, but you're right, it, is, it does take um, a lot of time in practice, Arc. I mean, I started practicing NMM like 20 years ago, and I wasn't doing it right, but I at least got something that looked okay. Um, and then since then, I've just been uh, trying to like kind of, kind of uh, get, you know, better and better at it. It's why I made, I made those three rules when the whole uh, highlight shadow under reflection thing, because Reaper asked me to do an NMM learn to paint kit. And so I actually had to, at that point, I had to stop and stare at metal and figure out how to break it down into the simplest possible terms for some silly pamphlet that only took up half a page, right? <laughs> half a page of typing. And that was what I came up with. And yet, even though I make fun of it later for being so simplistic, it still gets you in the ballpark. So that's how I, that's like, after I did that pamphlet, after I did that learn to paint kit, I started just applying those rules. And then I started looking at more and more real world examples and seeing how those rules um, twisted, depending on um, the source of the light, the shape of the, uh, the shape of the area, how shiny the area was. I started really studying metal more. But yeah, it takes time, right? And if you don't have the oomph, then you don't have the oomph. And some people would, I mean, I still like metallics on bigger pieces. Oh, miniature is dead. Of course, Luca raids us after we've had this awesome long discussion about NMM. <laughs> thanks, Luca. No, seriously, thanks. <laughs> but now that we're to the, back to the boring, like almost the end of our stream. I'm very sorry, alpacas. Your, your master, your lord and master has... Uh, has rated us uh, very late in the stream. But we did have a very long discussion about Namatog Metal. <sighs> but yeah, well, so whether you blend this or you do a spot highlight on it, it's gonna depend on um, your assessment of how shiny the surface is. If this was a wet or extremely shiny surface, you would just spot highlight it and move on, right? You and then you'd maybe do a bunch of spot highlights down the front, and you wouldn't do that blend that I did there. So, and then of course there's the people who know the rules but like to paint in a more stylistic way, a looser way, and their stuff still ends up looking great. But they but they tw they pull the rules in various directions all through the process. So. Like there's, there's so many ways to go with this and there's so many ways to do NMM and just like every other aspect of miniature painting, you can, you can really twist those rules. You, you can make them like do somersaults, but the best NMM, I should almost, I should almost grab some. Okay. Actually I'm going to, I'm going to grab, I'm going to grab a best NMM. Hold on one second. Hang out with me guys. Just one more minute. I have to grab something from the miniatures case. One second. I'm grabbing this because we own it. Dang it. So I'm going to give full credit to the painter. This is not me. This is not David. This is Kirill. Kirill Knave. We own this model. David owns this model. So here you can see where the, the rules are still upheld, but they're changed depending on the directional of the light source. Uh, Kirill, I'm told, uses uh, 3D rendering programs sometimes to figure out where his light goes um, to produce uh, really realistic effects. 
this is one of the main models in his book, by the way, which is well worth picking up. Um, so you can right away see kind of still the basics of what I'm saying with the, the light and then the shadow and then the reflection, right? Light, shadow, reflection. He's blending in a little bit because this is a burnished color, right? This is a burnished like bronze or um, brass. Uh, so you still see that. But you can really see like the, the difference between the realistic skin treatment and the, it makes the helmet look even more real, right? And you can definitely see where the light source is coming from, can't you? Because you can see where it's brightest. Then you've got, because it's around, you have bands of light and dark, and there is the reflected light on this side. So you can see exactly what I've been talking about. Here again, you've got kind of bands of light and dark, and when you see this banded effect, which is really popular on swords these days, um, and, uh, and also, you know, big armor like this, what it's essentially trying to convey to you is that the light is being interrupted by things in the environment. Uh, but you're also on a cylinder, so you're definitely going to see a highlight, a shadow, a reflection, you know, um, like more the reflections down here. So highlight, shadow, highlight, darker shadow, reflection. Um, so cylinders are a little bit weird. And then here you can see he's actually using uh, colors to tell you that there is green in the environment over here and gold or green and brass. Now down here we've got more gold than brass, and so a much richer um, he doesn't quite take it up to white. It's close, but it ends up um, just looking much richer. It's not, a lot of this isn't pointed directly at the light. He does go up to a very pale yellow on the highlights, though. Uh, so, yeah. So, this is Kirill Kanev, um, who is a Russian painter who's very, very good. Uh, I love his style. He's my favorite painter in the world because I love his realism. Uh, so yeah, so that's Kirill, and he did great textures on the, the cloth and everything, too. So definitely, definitely give credit to Kirill for this. Um, it's in David's collection. He actually um, commissioned Kirill to do a piece. Here's the back of that helmet, by the way. And uh, yeah, so that's like what you can do with NMM when you really, really, uh, really grok it or, or have a 3D rendering program to, uh, to render it for you. But even here, even here, you have the highlight, the shadow, and the reflection. You've got alternating bands of that. And that's what gives you that shiny appearance and the reflective quality. So there you go. There, we've managed to derail the stream entirely by talking about non-metallic metal. <laughs> oh, lordy. But hey, we got some progress, kinda, mostly. Anyway, yes, but that's Kirill's bust. I love Kirill's paint job. But yeah, so you can go crazy with that MM or you can stay simple. Um, obviously, on bigger models like that bust, it's very large. You can get a lot more realistic the bigger the model. Uh, on really little guys like the 28 millimeters we love to paint uh, here at Reaper, uh, there's a limit. There's a top and a bottom. You tend to simplify a lot more. You tend to not be able to get as complicated. Uh, busts are probably the best arena for doing complex NMM these days uh, and statues. Um, but a lot of the time on big stuff, I like to do metallics and do shaded metallics instead. So you can do either. Um, Right. So, and if you, if you want to do metallics because you can't handle NMM, you also can like do really good metallics like Mr. Grumpy and you can put a lot of weathering and cool stuff on there. So there is, there is, you can take metallics to the top as well. Like you don't have to do NMM to be competitive or to look awesome. Like you can do metallics and, and uh, have them look great. So yeah. All right. That's all I'm going to say on it. Um, I think we're pretty good tomorrow. We are back to working on the Kidda and his diorama. So even though Halloween has passed, we are still working on our Necromancer. Um, so tomorrow is Necromancer Day. Yeah, I mean, there are rules with NMM, but you can definitely twist them, Daffodweer. And, and you don't have to think that you can't be, uh, like, you can still do metallics and, and do very competitive, cool stuff with them. Uh, so, yeah. So we're going to be doing, uh, working on our basing for the, I'll probably do a lot of putty work tomorrow on this to get, and we'll figure out how we're going to get Kitty's base to, to slot in here, if I'm going to do a cutout or not. Um, doo -doo -doo. Okay, no Luca today. I see. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Marty the cat, Penrick? Was that a question for me? Oh, I remember. I remember. I think I remember. Wasn't it, wasn't it YouTube or something? Or I don't remember. Maybe I don't remember. Anyway, so <laughs> we, yes, have a nice day, everybody. Um, we'll be back tomorrow with Kitta. 
Kitta and his little undead friend, which is from Dark Sword Miniatures. Uh, and yeah, have a great day, and uh, I will talk to you all later. I have a puppy to take for a walk. Have a good one.